Good morning, friends. Bob and Brian with LifeSafe Training. Today, we have a lot of important things to cover. Uh, I'm, I'll apologize ahead of time for the length of what this uh, video may turn into. We're gonna keep it as concise as possible. We've got about six pretty major things that are changing within uh, Connecticut law, sometimes affecting federal law, definitely affecting uh, all of us in the Second Amendment community and all of the us that, that have firearms. So we're gonna kinda go through them uh, one by one. We are not lawyers. This is not legal advice. Uh, there will be some places where we'll perhaps recommend you talk to a lawyer. Um, that's up to you. We're gonna give you our best advice kind of moving forward. So with that, Brian, what's topic number one? Well, all right, yep, so let me just quickly cover the six things so you know what we're talking about. Uh, open carry laws, bulk purchase laws, safe storage laws that are happening um, and have some changes to them. Person to person transfers, uh, two year expirations on certificates and then the assault weapons ban uh, here in Connecticut. So the first one is um, the banning of open carry, which was a convenience law, as far as I'm concerned, but we're no longer allowed to open carry. Tactically always good to conceal carry, I get it, uh, but if you're someone like me that always has some kind of cover garment on, I have gotten very used to um, uh, carrying outside the waistband, I need to make that now happen inside the waistband and conceal it. Um, so no longer can you open carry in the state. It is a concealed carry state only. <clears throat> concealed carry state, that's uh, pretty important. Another thing pretty important, uh, we are now limited thanks to our, uh, in the infinite wisdom of our Connecticut legislature to buying three handguns in a calendar month. Three handguns in a calendar month. There is an exemption. The exemption is for NRA instructors. Now it specifically states NRA instructors. It does not state instructors. So I suppose if you're a USCCA instructor and you wanna submit your credentials to the state, they may allow you to purchase up to six, but that's your monthly limit. Uh, it, it's up to the state of Connecticut to kind of enforce that, but please be careful, friends. If you know that you've already bought three and you choose to go to another gun store and buy another one in the same calendar month and the state catches up with you, that's on you. So please be careful with that. Safe storage laws. So you must in the state, and you must continue to in this state, Keep your firearms at home away from persons who are unauthorized to use them. Think children, or if you have guests coming over, you have to keep them locked up. However, it used to be that if you were home alone and you wanted to stage uh, guns for your own safety and no one else was coming over, and there were no kids in the house, uh, you could do that. So. Bob and Carol that, who live alone, their children are grown and out of the house. If Bob wanted to have uh, a firearm uh, or a shotgun staged for self-defense, he could certainly do that. He could no longer do that unless it is uh, within reasonable proximity of him having it. So think of it this way. If you carry in your home, you're fine. You have complete control over that firearm. If you have your firearm on your nightstand and you go to sleep, you are reasonably in charge of that firearm even though you're asleep. But if you get up and walk 30 feet and go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, this is sort of where the law breaks down. I guess you're no longer uh, in reasonable control of that firearm and so you would be breaking the law at that point. The idea is that we want to keep guns away from folks that may hurt themselves with them. That's really the, the driving spirit of the law. Children, got it. So keep everything locked up. They do say that it has to be stored in a safe. Again, not a great uh, definition of what a safe is, so use your best judgment. Don't be the first guy that gets caught. 
um, maybe make it extra safe. Um, but I think what this really comes down to is it might be it's time to carry it home because uh, that's the only way you're really going to be able to use your weapon uh, in a manner to self-defend yourself. You're not going to have time to go run down to the basement or your, or your closet, unlock the safe, load the gun, and go. Thoughts on this? Thoughts, yeah, consider perhaps a, a bedside uh, biometric or quick access safe, something like that. Uh, they do make those things for long guns as well. So if your long gun is, is in your closet or, or under your bed, wherever it is, and, and that's your preferred self-defense mechanism at home, uh, you know, just be aware of, be aware of the laws. They're, they're, not, they're not getting better for, for law-abiding citizens. Uh, person next. to person transfers. So person to person transfers. This is a big one. This is not part of the of the 2023 assault weapon law that was passed, but it's recently come out in Connecticut that ATF will no longer issue NICs, National Instant Check System numbers, for private party transfers. So up until now, if I wanted to sell Brian a gun that was registered to me. Brian and I would fill this out together. I would call Department of Public Safety as the gun owner. I would get an authorization number. They would run an instant uh, background check on Brian and it would become Brian's gun. I would then file the paperwork the way I'm supposed to as a seller. No more. Uh, so all private transfers now have to go through FFLs, Federal Firearms Licensee, or a gun store. Gun store has a Federal Firearms License. Now, I have a Federal Firearms License, but let me just explain without drawing this out too long. It is a lot of paperwork on the end of the FFL to do this. So if Brian wants to sell a gun to a friend of his or a client of his, he needs to come here to my FFL with the firearm, with the other person. I have to log it onto my books, get an authorization number for the gun from the state police. The buyer now fills out the ATF form 4473 in the Connecticut form DPS 67. Then the dealer creates a new DPS 3C digitally uh, or manually. So in other words, one, one of these, but done by the FFL. It then gets logged out of the FFL's books and it's the possession of the new owner. Now it's a tremendous amount of work. It takes quite a bit more time than a person to person transfer would have done. And honestly, it's gonna take a lot of resources from gun stores. Please, please, don't think your gun stores are screwing you when they want to charge you $50 to $150 to make these transfers. I think $50 is too cheap. I think my time is, is worth more than that. I honestly would rather not do these at all. I would rather refer you to uh, commercial gun stores that have walk-in traffic, brick and mortar stores, if you will. And what they charge you is what they charge you. They, they are not ripping you off. They're just trying to cover their costs. They need to keep these records for as long as they're in business. It's paper, it's digital, it's books, it's a lot of work. I'm sorry, it wasn't part of the law, but it's happened and it is what it is and, and it's really unfortunate for all of us. But it is what it is. Adding to more paperwork. Yeah, just what we all need. This is... Um this has to do with pistol permit certifications. For nearly a decade now, I have been uh, handing out permit certifications with Bob. Upon successful completion Upon of an completion. eight hour class. <laughs> and we have told them, hey, great news. These certificates never expire. Please, you know, don't lose them. This is great. You don't have to sit in this uh, class again. The law says that these are good forever. That is no longer the case. 
your pistol permit certificate, which makes you eligible to apply for your pistol permit, now expires in two years. So if you wait, and I know there are folks that have waited, and I probably suggested that uh, you know these things never expire, that is no longer true. They yank the rug out from underneath us and they say, oh, now they expire. Even those that have already been issued are now going to expire. So you will need to take another class. Um, that's unfortunate, but you know, they're the lawmakers, so they get to make the law. So keep that in mind, two year expiration on permit certs. Yep. Let's talk about some assault weapons. Oh boy. So uh, the 2023 assault weapon ban here in Connecticut uh, made things like this an assault weapon. This was not an assault weapon. This was what we commonly refer to as an other. Uh, I bought the receiver. I built the gun to legal specification here in Connecticut and I enjoyed the gun. Uh, under new 2023 regulations, it's now considered an assault weapon. Pre-bans, if you were familiar with this, the pre-1994 federal assault weapon ban, when that went into effect, um, we would call firearms made before that pre-ban. Pre-bans were always exempt as, ex as assault weapons in Connecticut, they're no longer exempt. So your, your pre-bans, whether they're uh, handguns or long guns, uh, may fall into the category of assault weapons. We're not gonna spend any time here today explaining what an assault weapon is. You can look that up on your own. It's pretty clearly defined. So there are definitions for assault weapons. If you have said assault weapons, you can go to the state of Connecticut Department of Public Safety's website. You're going to find these instructions and we're gonna put some links in this video, either as QR codes in the video or possibly in the comment section below. We'll put links there. We will also put them under tactical tidbits on lifesafetraining.com. So if you go to our website, under the main navigation called Tactical Tidbits, the last entry in there will be links to these forms. So there are only seven semi-confusing pages to the instructions. The first thing you have to do is you're gonna have to create an account for yourself. When you create the account, it's going to make you verify the account and it's gonna make you verify the account by probably sending an email to the email address that you used. You'll then click on that link. That shouldn't be foreign to you. You probably do that with other things. So you're gonna to have to verify your account. You will need to have access to your own email from wherever you're doing this. I'm gonna ask you not to go to your FFL and ask your FFL if you can do it at their store. They're there to sell guns and to help you with gun accessories. They're not there to do paperwork for you or with you. So once you have your account created, you're gonna log in. Now, it's been my experience, every time I log in, the system forces me to receive a, a six digit code on my cell phone by SMS text. So I receive that six digit code, I go in and I verify that it's me. That's honestly not a bad thing. I'm glad that it's verifying that it's me. So after I get logged in, I have a couple of options. One option is assault weapon registration. So under assault weapon registration, and I'm gonna tell you guys right now, this is no picnic. Their website is a little bit confusing and it's not particularly intuitive. What it's gonna do, it's gonna show you a list of all the guns that it thinks are registered to you. 
Full transparency, there are guns from the 1980s that I sold to gun dealers still listed under my name. So just keep paging through. If you've been around the gun, the, the gun community as long as I have, you're going to have a lot of these. Keep paging through, and you may not see everything that's registered to you. We're going to talk about that as well. So find the gun that you want to register as an assault weapon. Now I'm going to throw a big caution to you right now. Do not pick guns that you want to be assault weapons. Only pick guns that are assault weapons. So what, what, what do I mean by that? So if you have a new Glock 19 and you decide you'd like to throw a threaded barrel in it and you're going to register it as an assault weapon, you're going to commit one of two felonies. Don't do that. If you had a pre-banned Glock 19 and you'd like to put a threaded barrel in it, feel free to go ahead and register that as an assault weapon. That's a legit assault weapon. You can't register something as an assault weapon that's not an assault weapon. Again, not a lawyer trying to keep you out of trouble. So you're going to select the gun you want to register as an assault weapon. It's now going to give you three different things on the screen that you have to confirm. One will be your, your name and address to make sure it's accurate. The second will be you'll need to upload a completed DPS-3C form showing that you possess this firearm prior to June 7th. I believe it's June 7th of 2023 when the governor signed this bill. So you're gonna to have to show them a DPS-3C. If you don't have the DPS-3C, you can sign and have an affidavit notarized saying that you lawfully uh, possessed this firearm prior to June 7th, 2023. I don't have all my DPS 3Cs. I chose to use an affidavit for most of them. So that's one form you have to update. Now there's a new form you're going to need to print. You're going to need to print a DPS 414C. The DPS 414C is your assault weapon certificate application. On it will be pertinent information relating to this and only this firearm, pertinent information relating to you, height, weight, address, driver's license number, etc. By the way, an operator number is a driver's license number. Um, caliber, and it's going to require two thumbprints. You can put a thumbprint on a piece of paper with a simple stamp pad. Don't get wrapped around the axle about needing fingerprint ink, anything like that. Any black ink that's going to transfer onto this paper is A-OK. -okay. So you're going to upload this form, your affidavit, or your DPS 3C with the registration form for that gun and that gun only. It gets herky. You may have to uh, do it a couple of times. You may have to do it in a specific order. Uh, I found it uh, frustrating uh, and, and again, very herky to, to get it done. But they, they all worked. I can't tell you there's a specific sequence on both of these two documents. Uh, on one of them, I don't remember which one, you, you have to check a box uh, attesting to the fact that the data is accurate. I, I believe it's the 414C, but I'm not positive. So you're going to upload all of those. If it works, it's going to say completed. When you go back to your list, it's going to show you a, a number, five, six digit number and it's gonna say under review. You will get, if you submit this by email and you do it all electronically, you will get an acknowledgement that will probably be in your junk folder. It was 100% in my junk folder. Uh, and DPS even tells you it could be in your junk folder. 
So make sure you look there. <clears throat> so you'll get an acknowledgement to that email address that you used, that your form is under review. That is not your position, your assault weapon possession certificate. It just acknowledges that your form is under review. If your gun is fairly new, you may or may not know that DPS is way behind on processing forms. So if you bought your gun in the last several months, like I did this one, if you bought your lower and you created it into a gun in the last several months, it's not going to show on your forms. At the very top of your list of guns, it will say click here if your firearm is not found. Click there. This process was actually easier than the process where they already knew what the gun was. So in this process, you're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna upload uh, a 414C, you're gonna upload a DPS 3C or an affidavit, and you're going to put in the characteristics of your gun. Those characteristics are gonna include manufacturer, importer, if there is an importer, serial number, model number, caliber, and any unique ID or markings. Um, so you're gonna put all that in there and then you're gonna uh, confirm that all that information is accurate. You're gonna hit submit. And again, it's gonna give you that number. I did 11 firearms for myself. Uh, I did them over uh, a couple of days. <clears throat> Some of them went pretty smoothly. Most of them did not, uh, but, but they're all uploaded. Full transparency, I made two mistakes. I made mistakes on serial numbers. What I did is I replied to the acknowledgement email with a new corrected 414C <clears throat> saying, my apologies, the serial number that I uploaded was incorrect Here's a new 414C with the correct serial number. Sorry, sorry for, the, for the misstep. I have not heard back from them in any way, shape, or form. I don't know how long it's gonna take to hear back from them. I don't know how long uh, it's gonna take to start getting assault weapon certificates back from them. I will tell you that you have a good amount of time to get these certificates submit. You have until May 1st, 2024. So you've got a while, but I really don't think you should wait. I think you should get on this pretty quickly, and I think you should get these submit. Um, uh, again, uh, I'm an FFL. I've gone through the process. It was confusing for me. I'm also pretty tech savvy. I know Brian's pretty tech savvy. Um, I, I would imagine he's going to have a couple of things to register as well. Um, this is not your amnesty period to register things that you chose not to register before the 2013 assault weapon ban after uh, the school tragedy here in Connecticut. <clears throat> Again, if you have things that you chose not to register then, you violated the law. If you choose to register them now when you should have registered them then, you will still be violating the law. You will either be committing a felony or committing perjury. So tread lightly, be careful, consult a lawyer if you need to consult a lawyer. Wow, that was a lot of talking. That was. And so these are really important uh, things. And unfortunately, we can't do this for you. So which is why we took a little extra time to very detailed go through what that process looks like. Um, but as you can imagine, you know, there are maybe 10,000 folks out there that know of life safe training. And if it takes two days for every person, like we can't, we can't do that. So <laughs> you have to, you have to, you know, figure this out on your own and it's a struggle and I apologize. Um, we didn't do it, not our fault. Um, but uh, good luck with it and, uh, you know, walk through the steps, kind of get in the mindset of being like, okay, 
this is a challenge and I'm gonna meet the challenge. Yeah, so last thing, last thing, uh, quick plug, quick self-promotion plug. Uh, regarding uh, open carry, on uh, October 5th at 6 p.m.? Six. At 6 p.m. Yep. Uh, at the Hartford Gun Club. Brian is gonna be leading a two and a half hour session called Gear and Gadgets. Uh, it's actually a USCCA uh, mini block. So you can register on the USCCA site or you can register at lifesafetraining.com under uh, our calendar. But we're gonna be talking a lot about gear for concealed carry. What kind of belt works best for us? What might work best for you? Different holster types, magazine car carriers, things like that. Things that will keep you compliant with the new laws. Uh, it's 30 bucks. <laughs> it's 30 bucks. There's no live fire involved. You don't need iPro or EarPro. If you want to bring some of your gear for people to take a look at, feel free. It, it could be show and tell. We will um, go through those things here, but it's a, it's a great session. It's very inexpensive. It's, it's two and a half hours uh, maximum. And if it helps keep you legal, comfortable, or comforted, we've, we've done a great job with it. Yeah, and I'll show you a couple of my tips for my gear. Uh, almost every time I get a new holster, there's a little bit of wiggle room. You know, what screw do I unscrew and how far do I do it? I have a heat gun that I'll bring in and show you that, you know, you can actually reheat the Kydex just a little bit to kind of make it a little bit uh, looser. Or if you need to pinch in, where to pinch in on heated Kydex to make the gun a little bit more secure. Just little tips that I have accumulated over 20 years. And uh, it's going to be a great little course. See a bunch of gear. So with that, Thank you, friends. Uh, Bob and Brian with LifeSafe Training. We hope this was beneficial, and, uh, and, and we apologize for the length. Have a great day.